Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's good to have you tuning in with us online. I'll be preaching from home this evening as I'm uh, stuck at home at the moment. So it'll be a little bit different. Uh, but can you please turn your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 9? We'll read verse 1 um, before we open in prayer. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. It says, And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Let's pray. So, me, Father, we do thank you, Lord, for this night. We thank you that we can um, take a bit of time to study out uh, this chapter in the in the uh, Word of God, Lord, we thank you for it. Thank you for your Word, and Lord, we do pray that this um, would be a, a blessing to us, uh, Lord. I pray that you would give me uh, wisdom, give me simplicity in my words, and I pray that it would be um, just used for your glory tonight, Lord, to challenge um, everyone listening and be an encouragement and a blessing to us as well, Lord. Uh, we ask you would um, just bless this time around your Word in Jesus' name, Amen. Now, Ephesians 4.32, a very common verse that everyone knows, even got a song about it. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. A lot of times with that verse, I think we uh, spend a lot of time focusing on the, the forgiving part of it. But the first couple of words in that verse as well, be ye kind one to another. Now, it's talking about a command that we have there to be kind to others and same as forgiveness because God hath forgiven us God God's good to us God's kind to us you know someone once said kindness is the language that the dumb can speak the deaf can hear and the blind can see you don't have to say it people know when it's there you know, kindness it's going the extra mile for others isn't it to make someone else's life a bit better happier now that's what God did for us in sending his son to die for us, in forgiving our sins. Now that's what God does for us in our lives every single day. God shows us abundant kindness and goodness in his love and mercy. You know, and in turn, this is how we should treat others, with the same love and the same kindness as God shows us. In this chapter, it's a perfect example of how David showed this kindness how david showed god's love and kindness to somebody else this sermon's going to be a little bit different um, tonight in that i actually don't have a three point outline two point outline four point outline or anything we've simply got one point um, and that point is david shows god's kindness you know back in chapter seven which was the last time i preached we looked at second Samuel chapter seven um, god had given david rest from his enemies um, he had rest from all about first time in his whole time as um, not only reigning as king, but before that, because he was on the run from Saul and things, God's finally given David rest. And we saw last time that in this time of rest, it was interesting. David, he thought to himself, what can I do for God? And he thought it'd be good to build the Lord a temple. You remember that from uh, last time. Uh, but it wasn't to be God's will. David looked around, he saw this beautiful palace, and he said, God doesn't have anywhere like that for himself, anywhere permanent place. Um, we're settled in the land, let's do it. God had other plans. God said, no, timing's not right, and it's not you that's going to build it, David, it's going to be your son. David was happy with that, and he praised God for that. This is what we looked at last time. And then we're going to skip over chapter 8. We're not going to go into that one tonight, but in chapter 8, David sets off to continue conquering um, the enemies in the promised land and taking the promised land that God had given them. And he defeated enemies such as the Philistines, the Moabites, the Syrians. Um, plus, at the end of chapter 8, we're told a bit about David's government, of how he set up his government in his kingdom. But we're not going to go into that tonight. We're going to skip over it. But once that's all said and done, David, like back in chapter 7, seems like he has a bit of downtime here. Seems like he has a bit of time to himself. And at the start of chapter 7, he asked himself, what can I do for God? And now, it seems like he's thinking um, something else very important. He's asking himself, what can I do for others? You know, we can learn a lot about David's character from what he thinks about in his downtime, can't we? When he has a bit of time to himself, at first he was thinking, what can I do for God? Now he's thinking, what can I do for others? 
It's a good attitude to have, a good thing to think about in our life. You know, his mind, no doubt, obviously he's thinking about the covenant that he made a long time ago with his friend Jonathan, with his dear friend Jonathan. We read about this covenant, I'm sure you know it, but we read about it in 1 Samuel chapter 20. 1 Samuel chapter 20. We'll read a few verses here now. Um, just as a little reminder, this is the part of the story where uh, Saul, he's attempted to try and kill David already. Um, and he's, he probably knows that David's um, going to be the next king chosen by God. He's trying to get rid of him. He doesn't like David. He's jealous of him, um, hates him. And then um, Jonathan and David, they're best friends. Um, and it's at the time where the king Saul has invited David to come to the meal. David's expected to be there. He doesn't want to go because he thinks um, King Saul is going to try and kill him again. Him and Jonathan come up with a bit of an agreement. Remember, Jonathan would go to the meal um, and see what sort of mood he was dad was in and go back out and have a secret rendezvous with David, shoot the arrows and you know, go beyond him. It means to, um, to go, it's not safe and all the rest of it. It's at this time that this conversation happens and we're going to read from verse 14. This is as they're making their bit of a um, deal before... Jonathan goes to the meal without David. And thou shalt not only, while yet I live, show me kindness of the Lord that I die not. This is verse 14. Can't remember if I said that, sorry. But also, thou shalt not cut off thy kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord hath cut off the enemies of David, every one from the face of the earth. This is Jonathan talking to David here. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, let the Lord even require it at the hand of David's enemies. And Jonathan caused David to swear again because he loved him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. And then drop down to verse 42. It says, And Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, for as much as we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord be between me and thee, and between my seed and thy seed forever. And he arose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. You know, so we, I remind you about when the time frame of this was and when Saul was trying to kill David. But the idea of this covenant had two parts to it. Jonathan's side of this covenant was that he was going to look after for David in the here and now, in the present. So while his father was trying to kill David, Jonathan would kind of be David's protector. He would look out for him. He would, uh, I guess, get the inside word on what his father was up to and warn David and look after and protect him as best he could that way. Um, David's side of the deal was that when he became king, which both Don, Jonathan and David knew that that was going to be happen, um, Jonathan knew that he wasn't going to be the next king. It would be passed on to David, and, and he was fine with that. He knew it was God's choice. But David's end of the deal was that when he becomes king, that he would look after Jonathan's seed, not um, harm them, not kill them as such, um, take care of them. Um, forever. You know, this was an important thing because back in those days, um, the the tradition, or well, it wasn't really right to do, but what would happen is when a king took over um, a nation from another king, they would set out to kill all the heirs, all the uh, leftover children of that king. So then there was none left. I mean, there was no one that could challenge them for the throne, no one that could um, say, hey, this throne's rightfully mine, I'm the heir of my father or his father was the king or whatever it is. So a lot of times the king would have killed off, in this case, Jonathan or Jonathan's children, whatever they're up to at the time. So they made this promise. Jonathan protect David now and David would protect Jonathan and his seed when he becomes king. You know, David, obviously, he was thinking about this promise, um, thinking about this covenant that he made. Um, in verse 1, when in verse 1 in chapter 9, he says, as we read, And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And David wanted to uphold his end of the deal. He wanted to um, fulfill his side of the covenant. And he wanted to show kindness to anyone that was left, um, as opposed to kill them like any other king would do. So he's, he's trying to find out, is there anyone that's actually still alive from Saul's line. He knew that Saul and Jonathan um, had both died. They both died in battle. Uh, he's trying to find out if there's anyone. We read on in verses 2 to 5, it says, And there was of the house of Saul a servant, whose name was Zeba. And when they had called unto him, David the king said unto him, Art thou Zeba? And he said, Thy servant is he. 
And he, the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul, that I may show him the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king Jonathan, unto the king, sorry, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto him, the king, Behold, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amamiel, in Lodabar. Then the king David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now the fact that David has to actively search for any family of Saul by seeking out one of Saul's servants and asking him if there's any left and that kind of implies that the son of Jonathan that we're told about here was probably in hiding, probably fearful of being killed by the king as, as other kings would have done by now. You know, but David makes his intentions clear right from the start. He says, is there anyone left so that I can show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? It says also in verse 3, show the kindness of God unto him. You know, David wanted to show to others the same kindness, the same goodness that God had shown to him. To him. This should be how we want to treat others, how we want to live our lives, shouldn't it? By showing others the same kindness, the same goodness that God has shown us, which is a lot of kindness, a lot of goodness. Now David told in these verses that we just read that, uh, that there is a servant, and the servant Zeba, and that he's a servant of um, Saul's. And he tells um, David that, yes, there is a son of Jonathan's who's still alive and he's lame on his feet. David immediately sends for him. Doesn't care about that detail that's chucked in there about him being lame on his feet. Doesn't change his mind, doesn't change anything. We first read about this son and how he became lame in 2 Samuel chapter 4. Go back there with me. 2 Samuel chapter 4. And in verse 4 it says, And Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame of his feet. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it came to pass, as she made haste to flee, that he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. We first read about him back here, this son of Jonathan's. His name's Mephibosheth. And he was five years old when news came um, that both Saul and Jonathan had been killed in battle. That's what it says when news came from Jezreel. They both died in battle. And his nurse picks him up and flees, runs away with him, probably fearful that the kingly line would be hunted, that someone would be coming after um, Saul and Jonathan's descendants, coming after this boy, even though he's only five, to kill him. So there's no um, contention, no challenge for the throne. Uh, wipe out the kingly line. She obviously, as she's running and fleeing with this five-year-old, she's stumbled somehow, tripped on something, and either her, herself, and the boy have both fallen to the ground, or she's dropped Mephibosheth. Whatever it is, he's fallen to the ground in this um, fleeing, and he's become lame. Obviously, he had some sort of injury, um, broken his back, or done something. He'd become a paraplegic, and he, he can't walk now. Now, Mephibosheth, his whole life, he would have grown up knowing this story, that the nurse had to flee, had to get out because his life was in danger, because someone was going to be coming and killing him because he was the son of Jonathan. And Jonathan and Saul had both died and there'd be a new king. And he, every, he would have known this. He would have grown up living this story. You know, he would have been fearful that David would still come after him one day. You know, he must have been terrified when messengers from David knocked at his door and demanded that he come with him to see the king. In the back of his mind, he probably anticipated the day when this would happen, when the King David would send for him and, and kill him just like every other, um, all the other enemy kings around. We can tell he's fearful by how he acts when he sees David and by David's response, which we read in verse 6 to 7. Let me go back to Second Samuel chapter 9. Verse 6 to 7, it says, Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. Mephibosheth, when he comes before 
um, King David he um, uh, the wording here there was he did reverence himself he fell on his face and did reverence himself he prostrates himself on the ground before David he lies flat on his face out of fear out of fear maybe possibly out of a bit of respect as well or, or um, seeming to show respect but mainly out of fear he feared what David was going to do for him and David's response confirms this when David says to him fear not in two simple words used so effectively so many times in the Bible aren't they fear not you know this though what David had said fear not it would have been meaningless it wouldn't have meant would have meant nothing to Mephibosheth unless David could give him a reason of why he didn't need to fear and prove it you know David did he explained to him why he was going to show him kindness and actually show him what the kindness was going to entail he told him it was for the sake of Jonathan his father perhaps he'd even heard about stories of how Jonathan and David were friends when they were younger best friends I don't know he explained to him it was for the sake of Jonathan his father and he explained what he wanted to do he wanted to return Saul's land to him give him what was rightfully his now Mephibosheth no doubt would have known about any land that Saul and Jonathan had owned any land that was effectively rightfully his to go and take but Mephibosheth he would have been uh, too scared to go and do it too scared to um, put forward his name and say hey I want to claim my father and grandfather's land it's rightfully mighty he wouldn't want to put his name out there he was fearful remember for his life he didn't want to expose himself so he never came forward and claimed any land that was rightfully his and David he says I want to give you that land I want to make it yours it, it is yours you know David goes beyond just returning his land though doesn't he he goes beyond that he says that he wants to give him the honor of a close relationship with the king by saying that he wants him to eat at his table continually you know why did David show such greatness so show such kindness sorry you know, sparing his life and returning his land that that would have been a great enough act of kindness in itself you know he went he would have gone above for that but no he went above and beyond again you know as he said in verse 3 this is the clue to it the key to it David said in verse 3 and the king said is there not yet any of the houses for that I may show the kindness of God unto him and it's not just about showing kindness for Jonathan's sake it's not just about keeping a covenant here this is not what this was about for David not simply you've got to keep my end of the bargain keep my end of the deal he wanted to show God's kindness to somebody else you know and that doesn't stop and at a simple task for someone as simple there you go that will do that's not where God's kindness stops you know, God's kindness and goodness it has no limits you know, God had brought David one commentator mentioned they could that God had brought David from the pasture to the palace from being a shepherd to being king you know, God had done a lot for David you know God's shown the same kindness to us too taken us from the mires of sin to make us his heirs God's done the same thing sort of thing for us showing us the same level of kindness and now David wants to show that kindness to someone else now verse 8 goes on it says and he bowed himself and said this is Mephibosheth what is thy servant that thou shouldest look on such a dead dog as I am Mephibosheth thought he was clearly unworthy of what David was offering clearly unworthy of such generosity he considered himself a dead dog meaning a worthless and insignificant person you know that's the, the worst of um, insults that could be made you know all the years of hiding from the king living in fear and poverty the lameness of his legs all of this it made Mephibosheth think that himself is worthless you know, this made no difference to David though just as it makes no difference to God David still wanted to say to show the same kindness no matter what Mephibosheth's state was it didn't matter that he thought himself as a dead dog if he was worthless or anything it made no difference to David and it makes no difference to God that we are wretched sinners you can see a bit of a picture being painted here between King David and Mephibosheth can't you now verse 9 to 12 goes on then the king called Ziba Saul's servant and said unto him 
I have given unto my ma thy master's son all that pertained unto Saul and to all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits that my master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, my, thy master's son, shall eat bread all way at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son, whose name was Micah, and all that dwelt in the house of Zeba were servants unto Mephibosheth. On top of these promises that David has made um, for um, Mephibosheth, he also commands Zeba, so commands Saul's servant, that he and his sons and servants will be Mephibosheth's servants and work for him, work for him tilling the ground. We're told here that um, Zeba, he has 15 sons of his own and 20 servants, so plenty of manpower. To fulfill this task given Saul would have I imagine owned quite a bit of land being the previous king surely he had a bit of land now, the food brought in from these fields it was to be used to feed Mephibosheth's family and, and themselves obviously or to be used however else Mephibosheth decided however Mephibosheth himself would not be eating this food as it's mentioned a few times in these verses he would be eating with the king continually dining at the king's table he was in no need for the food. So it would be treated as though he were a son of the king, we're told in these verses. We're told that Mephibosheth himself, he's got a son named Micah. He would have, he would have effectively been the servant's master, I'd imagine. Now, quite a familiar picture, isn't it, Mephibosheth? He considered himself a dead dog. He's living in poverty. He's lame. He's scared. He thinks his wife's life's worthless. But the king, the king, he takes him in, has time for him, takes him in. It doesn't matter to the king what Mephibosheth looks like or what his life's like. It makes no difference. He takes him in and not only takes him in, but makes him his child. Mephibosheth feasts with the king at his table. And it's a great picture of what Christ did for us, isn't it? And that one day we will feast with him. Now that's the point, isn't it? David was showing God's love and kindness to Mephibosheth in literally showing, demonstrating the greatest act of love and kindness that God has given to us, showing that in this man, Mephibosheth. You know, the world would have done the opposite. The world would have had him killed. It would have said to David, kill him. He'll steal your throne. He'll steal your kingdom. He'll challenge you for it. Have him put to death. Or being very generous the world would have said hey you gave him his land back you spared his life that's enough you don't need to do any more or the world would have said hey look at him he's lame he's worthless you don't want anything to do with him and not god though and not david verse 13 to finish it off so mephibosheth dwelt in jerusalem for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet David fulfilled his covenant to Jonathan by showing kindness to his seed. And indeed, he also fulfilled his promises to Mephibosheth too. And like we said earlier, though, it's not for David. This wasn't really about just fulfilling a promise. Yeah, you know, I promise that I need to go and do that. I better do that. No, it was about showing God's kindness to someone else. which God's kindness knows no limits. We can learn a lot about David's character from this, can't we? Not only was David a man of his word, he fulfilled his covenants, but he also went out of his way to show God's kindness to someone else. You know, what David did was an expression of what God had done for him. Like we said earlier, bringing him from the pasture to the palace, from being a shepherd to the king. That's what God had done for David. Now, God is good and kind. And we're called to be like him. Kindness, after all, is a fruit of the Spirit, isn't it? The word gentleness in our list of the fruits of the Spirit is translated as kindness elsewhere else in the elsewhere in the Bible. It's kindness. Kindness is a fruit of the Spirit, which is something that we should be demonstrating in our lives if we're walking with God. You know, I wonder, can people see the difference in us? 
Can people see the love of God coming out of us? Can people see God's kindness in us? You know, if God has been so good to us, and indeed he has, then let us ask the same question that David asked at the start of this chapter. Is there anyone I can show God's kindness to? Ask yourselves that question. Is there anyone I can show God's kindness to? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this night. We thank you for this time. We've been able to study out your word. We thank you so much for David's kindness. We thank you for the wonderful picture it is here of your kindness to us, Lord. And we know you are the, the great God, the gracious God, the merciful God, and the most uh, the biggest act of kindness and love that could ever be imagined was when you sent your son to die for us. And Lord, we thank you for that you've done that for us and you make us your heirs to feast with you one day. Lord, we just um, pray that you would help us then um, now that we've received this kindness of you to show this kindness to others, just as David did. That was to ask the question in our lives, is there anyone that I can show the kindness of God to? Lord, help us to look for these chances to be kind to others, to um, show your love and goodness in, in such a practical way for others, Lord. We do pray that you bless us this night um, as we finish off. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you for joining in with us. Thanks for listening, joining in for this message. Um, enjoy, make sure you enjoy some time of prayer with your family tonight, being a, a Wednesday night Bible study night. The pastor would have sent out the uh, prayer list. Um, so make sure you spend a bit of time in prayer afterwards. Thank you.